Thank you to Dale and Rob for a special music today and Faith for children's sermon. And Stephen, we can help you find that answer sometime if you don't. That was priceless, priceless. We'll say it like this. Um, I remember Faith loves doing puzzles and she'll get these thousand piece puzzles. And, and I don't like puzzles, but I would always like to try to find a piece and stick it somewhere that it doesn't belong and kind of cram it in there and see if she would discover it, and she always did. So anyway, um, again, um, and again, thanks to our VBS folks uh, for preparing, and we look forward to a wonderful week of celebration. There was a uh, well-known uh, Christian apologist who once said, you've got to read the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other hand, and certainly there's a, a great truth to that. And we know that uh, as a nation we uh, have faced monu- uh, momentous events here this past week, especially on Friday, uh, with the Supreme Court's ruling on marriage. And we knew that some sort of ruling was coming, and and we didn't know quite when. Um, And so I thought that this is an issue I'd like to talk about, but next week. I'd like to have time to reflect on it and pray about it um, and and do, you know, my due diligence in... in, um, in searching out what exactly was said, what wasn't said, and, and to looking at where we need to go from this as God's people. I do know that our uh, focus verse next week will be Acts 5.29, uh, and if that's something you want to look at ahead and pray and meditate about. But leading up to that, there's also been a verse on my mind about how God's people are supposed to be in the world today. And, uh, and, and there's a person in the Bible who stands out for whom God used in a special way. Her name was Esther. Esther is one of the most unique books of the Bible, and in fact, there's a little background I need to give it uh, to you today so it'll make sense. One of the seminal events in Jewish history was their exile to Babylon, which actually started in 605 BC and occurred in three main waves, the last of which happened in 586 BC. The temple was destroyed, uh, the Jews were deported to Babylon, and it was a terrible event. It's what, what they always remember. Interestingly, out of this event was the birth of the synagogue. That's another story. But 586 B.C., very monumental date in Jewish history. Uh, 539 B.C., Cyrus the Persian overthrows the Babylonians, and Cyrus had a policy of letting exiles return to their homeland, and the Jews over the next decades start doing just that. Uh, but some don't. Some remain in dispersion uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the world. And uh, as time comes, we see this is the period of Nehemiah, uh, who is an administrator uh, in, in, um, in the, the Persian kingdom, uh, Ezra, who is a priest and who sought to renew the people's uh, dedication to God, and also a contemporary of this all is Esther. And Esther's story is this. I'm going to kind of compress it. Esther was a Jewish woman living in the city of Susa, which was the capital of the Persian Empire, uh, southwest Iran, I believe it is now. And uh, she was raised by her cousin Mordecai after her parents had died. And uh, Esther was a very, she grew to be a very beautiful woman. And one day King Xerxes, uh, he deposed his queen Vashti because she would not debase herself in front of him and his guests. And eventually a new search was put out throughout the kingdom for a new queen, and Esther was chosen. Um, Esther, though, is in the process of hiding her faith, really. And things come to, a, come to a, a boil when Esther's cousin Mordecai, her surrogate father, has a, a feud with one of Xerxes' chief officials, and the official decides he not only wants to kill Mordecai, he wants to annihilate every last Jewish person in the world. And so this is the uh, background as we get into our reading today. Esther is put on a spot where she must now decide what is her mission in life, What has God raised her up to do? And it's not as easy as you think. I mean, you think about your own life. How has God called me to live out my faith? Um, Esther, though, does come come to God in faith, and and the results are good. You'd have to read the whole book of Esther to find that out. But today we're looking in chapter 4. If you would turn with me to Esther 4, and we're beginning in verse 1 through verse 17. Friends, hear the word of the Lord. And again, I'll I'll give some comments as we go along to help uh, fill in the gaps said, when Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews with Basking and weeping and wailing, many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Okay, so what are they reacting against they are reacting against the order of the king 
that on the last, a certain day, on the last day of the month, all the Jews were to be put to death. This is what his chief of staff, a man named Haman, had kind of fooled Xerxes into approving. So he does this. This gets posted throughout the kingdom. And all of a sudden, the Jews saying, we're living under a death sentence. And in fact, just the chapter before, it said, while the king and Haman went out to drink and party and do everything, it said the whole city was bewildered. Why would the king do this? This makes no sense. But according to the law, laws of the Medes and Persians, once a king issued a law, it could not be revoked because they saw their kings as divine, and to revoke a law meant that the king was fallible, and they said their kings couldn't be fallible. So this law was set in stone on the last month of the year. Uh, on a certain day, all the Jews would be put to death, and of course there's great uh, weeping about that. In verse 4 it says, When Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathach, one of the king's eunuchs assigned to its ender, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathach went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. See, th this guy Haman, and by the way, this, you, can do, you can study Esther a lot of ways. One way is to do a character study of everybody in the book. This guy Haman, there was nobody higher in the kingdom except King Xerxes, and yet it wasn't enough which will eventually lead to his downfall. But he hated Mordecai, and he hated the Jews so much, he said, I will even finance this project personally, out of my own pocket, just so we make sure every last Jewish person is put to death. Um, uh, let's see, where were we? Um, so Hathach went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury, for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther and explain it to her. And he told him to urge her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. So it's pretty clear. Mordecai says, Esther, you got to step up. Our lives are, are, I mean, they're forfeit now if something doesn't happen. Hathach went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that he be put to death. The only exception to this is for the king to extend the gold scepter to him and spare his life. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. So what you're seeing here is Esther's reluctance. And she's reluctant for a lot of reasons. One, the law. Nobody could go to the king without an appointment, without the king actually summoning them, except if he granted them special favor. But also, and this is really interesting, King Xerxes was a man who didn't sleep alone. But he didn't always sleep with his wife. And she says, it's been 30 days since I've been called to the king. Esther may fear, just like her predecessor, that she's fallen out of favor that she no longer has Xerxes' goodwill, and that to appear before him would mean her instant death. He was a very contemptible man in a lot of ways, and Esther is right to be afraid of him. Verse 12, it says, When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, Relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. The actual Hebrew reads it as more of a passive verb, that you have been brought to royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me, do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me?
Father God, we thank you for your holy word, the living word, our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray now, Lord, that the words of my mouth, the meditations of all our hearts would be pure and acceptable in your sight, our Lord, our rock, and our redeemer. In Jesus' holy name, we pray and give thanks. Amen. I want to tell you this morning about a young woman whose name is Chelsea, Chelsea Richard. And she's a young woman you probably never heard of, but she is a woman of extraordinary character. It did something a few years ago that proved her character. As a senior and captain of her high school's golf team, Chelsea was playing the qualifying rounds of her state's high school championship. But on the second hole, she hit her tee shot into the rough. Not the best way to start off, of course. Then again, she had 16 holes still in front of her to recover. Unfortunately, though, and without realizing it, she accidentally played another golfer's ball out of the rough and finished the hole. But it wasn't until the third tee that she realized what she'd done. See, Chelsea plays with a particular type of golf ball, which she marks with a little blue line to identify, but the ball she played out of the rough had no such marking. Thing was, she was the only one who noticed. But it wasn't just a matter of, of reporting the error and maybe taking a penalty stroke or such. The rules said that a golfer must declare the wrong ball penalty before putting or be disqualified, so Chelsea faced a difficult choice. She could keep quiet about her error and go on, after all, it was an honest mistake, and, and she certainly didn't gain any competitive advantage by it. Nobody would be any the wiser if she didn't say anything. Or she could report the infraction and possibly be disqualified and lose a chance of competing for the state championship. What would you do? Well, drawing on our favorite Bible verse, Philippians 4.13, which says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, Chelsea swallowed hard and reported the infraction. She was immediately disqualified, which ended her high school career and her dream of winning a state title. And while it obviously wasn't the way she wanted to cap off her senior year, Chelsea later said, she said, with my faith and with God, being honest was the most important thing to me, and that's what's going to advance on throughout my life. Being honest and making the right choices. The remarkable young woman, not only for what she did, but also for understanding that doing the right thing often is not the easy thing. In fact, doing the right thing tends to make life harder. That's a lesson a lot of us never fully master as we as we bob and way or weave our way through life looking you know for shortcuts falling back on situational ethics or simply what's convenient at the time i like the story of an anonymous letter received by the irs one day in it was written to whom it may concern it said last year when i filled up my tax return i deliberately misrepresented my income now i so feel, feel so guilty i can't sleep at night and closed is a $1,500 cashier's check. P.S., if I still can't sleep, I'll send the rest. <laughs> you know, it's funny, but that's often the way it is, isn't it? We, we do just enough to salve our conscience, but, but what do you do when doing the right thing is costly, when doing the right thing is the hard thing? That's not only a question for us today, it's a question a young woman named Esther faced herself. Now, as I said, the book of Esther is one of the most unique books in the entire Bible, for starters. It's the only book of the Bible that doesn't actually mention God. You won't find the word God or Lord in there anywhere in the book, although God's presence is clearly felt throughout the story. But on top of that, and we've got to get the correct picture of Esther, Esther's not simply some damsel in distress, she's actually queen of the Persian Empire. But she's also a young woman who's made some compromises on her way to the top. And what she ultimately has to decide today is whether to risk it all by stepping out and doing the right thing or to stay safely ensconced in the shadows. 
Now, reflecting on Esther's life, um, John Ortberg, one of my favorite pastors and authors, he, he says this, he says, you and I, you and I were created to have a mission in life. We were made to make a difference. But if we do not pursue the mission for which God made us, we will find a substitute. And that substitute is what he calls our shadow mission. That thing that gets us off track of fulfilling God's purposes for our lives, it's where we'll eventually drift if we aren't intentional. And, and each of us, Ortberg says, each of us has a shadow mission. For example, you know, one of my youthful dreams, if I couldn't play shortstop for the Mets, which that wasn't going well, but my other dream was to be a college professor and a coach. You know, I, I thought that it would be just, just such a great life doing that at a small college somewhere. And so I kind of always was looking toward that. But, but ever since childhood, I'd also felt God tugging at me. And, and as I got older, that tugging eventually drew me into pastoral ministry. It's where I knew where God wanted me. But, but I never gave up that earlier dream. You know, maybe still coaching somehow. And so for several years, I, I tried doing both. I coached at actually several large high schools, in fact, head coach of a couple of them, while serving a downtown congregation, and I juggled it all adequately. But more and more I felt that the time I spent coaching was getting in the way of what I was called to do at the church. Nothing earth-shattering, just this feeling that it was a little off-center, not quite where I was supposed to be. And my wake-up call came one day shortly after the season ended when a church member phoned and told me that he was struggling with thoughts of suicide. And I remember that. I remember because it was 4 o'clock in the afternoon when he called. And I remember thinking that if this call had come just one week earlier, I'd already had been out on the field coaching and wouldn't have been available when this person needed me. That's when I knew what my shadow mission was and how it was pulling me away from what God really wanted me to do. Our shadow mission is whatever gets us off track from God's call and His plan for our lives. Well, Esther's shadow mission had become her life in the palace, the, the wealthy, pampered life of a powerful wife, of a powerful king. A woman whose only duty it was to, was to sit there and be beautiful and be available when the king called. You see, far from being a hero, which is often how we look at Esther at first, Esther, she, she was kind of a sellout, at least initially. And I know that sounds harsh, and it's not always the way we think about her, but, but Esther, as I said before, she's part of this large Jewish remnant that had been carried off into exile, you know, roughly a century before her parents, her grandparents, and, 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 and now the exiles are all dispersed, dispersed throughout the kingdom. But unlike the other exiles we see in the Bible, you remember, say, Joseph in Egypt some years before, or even Daniel in Babylon, unlike these folks, who in the words of Carolyn Custis James said, held their ground out of loyalty to God and suffered plenty for it. She said Esther didn't display the same passionate loyalty to God or his people. Instead, she shed her Jewish name. Her real name was actually Hadessa. She concealed her true identity, and she morphed into the surrounding culture. And at a time when Jews were being released from exile and were returning home and recommitting to their faith, Esther was living large in the palace and keeping her faith at arm's length. Rather than clinging to her heritage and fiercely defending her identity as one of God's covenant people, Esther chose to play the game and roll with the punches. And so when she's deemed fairest in the land and chosen to be Xerxes' new bride, Esther slides seamlessly into the role, never realizing that little by little she was losing her way. And when crisis comes, as it inevitably does, the question becomes not only how can God redeem his people, but how can God redeem Esther as well? But I don't want to give you the wrong impression. Esther, she wasn't a bad woman by any stretch of the imagination besides the fact that she apparently was a complete knockout 
And I imagine she was a lot like the rest of us, just someone trying to figure it all out and try to make their way through life the best they could. It's as if she'd forgotten that her purpose in life wasn't simply to be a trophy wife for the king to show off and to live in a kind of insulated luxury, but to seek God's mission and pursue it. And it took a crisis of epic proportions to wake her up and remind her. You see, and and this is where, again, we have to summarize the larger story. Her cousin Mordecai, who'd adopted and raised her, had offended Haman, the powerful court official, by refusing to bow down to him. And Haman's so enraged that he makes plans not only to kill Mordecai, but all the Jews in the Persian kingdom, a kingdom that stretched from India all the way to Africa and included everything in between. And as I said, Haman's so enraged, he even offers to bankroll the whole operation himself, duping Xerxes into issuing this decree that on a certain day and a certain month, all the Jews would systematically be wiped out. And it's this crisis that's got Mordecai standing outside the palace gates in sackcloth, hoping to get Esther's attention and enlist her help. And Mordecai's message was simple. We're all going to die. You've got to do something. The question, of course, is what? What do you do? See, Esther's never been trained for anything like this. Nothing in her experience has ever prepared her for a crisis like this. But suddenly, silence was no longer an option. Sitting on the sidelines would no longer do. And Mordecai's plea that along with the challenge that if Esther doesn't do something, God will still find a way. They'll perish, but God will find a way. Well, it begins to stir something inside of Esther, and it reawakens her to her true mission in life. The fact is that deep down, deep down, we all want our lives to matter, don't we? Somehow, some way, we, we want to make a difference. God created us with this insatiable desire for significance. I I mean, you know, if not, why else would we even want to grow up? Pastor and author Edwin McManus puts it like this. He says, here you are, five years old, and you want to be a doctor. What on earth for? You don't need a job. All your bills are being paid. You have food and shelter, clothes, toys, a chauffeur a personal bodyguard, and a private chef. It's never going to get any better. So why change if not for this yearning for significance? See, God created us with a desire for something more. He created us with a desire for himself, and he invites us to join with him in his great plan of redemption for the world. But part of this plan is waking up from our slumber, coming down out of the stands, and getting into the game. It's understanding that with God, nothing happens by chance. Everything ultimately has a purpose. And that you and I have been put where we've been put, and we've been given the gifts and resources that we've been given for such a time as this meaning. Meaning that the significance we ultimately seek comes from our relationship with God, and that doing the right thing is often not the easy thing, but that God calls us to trust him and do it anyway. Fact is, Esther, she'd rather not have found herself in the position she was in. Esther was a people pleaser. Besides sitting there and looking pretty, that's what she did best. And people liked her. Everybody liked Esther. You know why? Because she knew her place and she didn't rock the boat. But as James says again, She says, Esther could no longer coast on her beauty, on her ability to please. Xerxes and Mordecai, the two most important men in her life, were at loggerheads. She couldn't obey them both. I mean, it's just been easier to just go on being queen and showing up at royal functions and and dazzling the king's dignitaries with her beauty and her charm. Instead, Esther's got to come to grips with the idea that she was put in a specific place, at a specific time, for a specific purpose, even if she didn't understand it. It's like what Phil Yancey says in his book, Disappointment with God. Yancey says, in the natural world, human beings only receive about 30% of the light spectrum. He adds, honeybees and homing pigeons can, for example, detect ultraviolet light waves invisible to us. 
And then he goes on and says, in the supernatural realm, our vision is even more limited, and we only get to see occasional glimpses of that unseen world. In other words, we don't always see the big picture. And Mordecai challenges Esther to consider that bigger picture today, that she was put where she was put for such a time as this, where she could make a difference and where God could use her in his great redemptive plan for the world. Admittedly, it's, it's a challenge that carries no guarantees, and, and Esther knows this. But I want you to notice something. The turning point in her life, in fact, the turning point in this entire book is when she finally agrees to go to the king at pain of death. Takes a while for her to get there, but she finally agrees to go, but only after all the Jews in Susa commit themselves to fasting and praying for three days. In other words, Esther recovers her voice and she rediscovers her mission when she commits her way to God. And that's what we discover, what on earth we were put here for too, when we give ourselves and commit ourselves to God. Right now my son is uh, getting ready to read Doris Goodwin Kearns' book, Team of Rivals, about Abraham Lincoln. And the book uh, portrays Lincoln's genius in, in making friends out of former foes, appointing election rivals to his cabinet, and even the way he was able to reconcile conflicting personalities on the way towards abolition and, and toward winning the Civil War. So in addition to everything he was, Abraham Lincoln was a bridge builder. He, he knew how to bring people together. He knew the importance of bringing people together. But he wasn't afraid to stand alone when he needed to. In fact, one story tells of a contro controversial decision he made, and Lincoln later reported to said, I put it to the cabinet to make this decision. I put it to the cabinet. It was eight to one. But I was the one. Well, let me tell you, to be a Christian is to be the one. And even more than that, it's to look to the one. You see, we have to look not at what Esther does. We really have to look at what she represents. Esther identifies with her people, and she goes to the king with the attitude, if I perish, I perish. But it's her willingness to identify with her people that allows her to mediate on their behalf. Esther puts herself squarely in the crosshairs, and as Tim Keller says, goes before the throne in a way no one else could. And because she received favor, she imputed that favor to all the people. Which is, of course, exactly what Jesus Christ has done for us. You know, Jesus Christ, if you think about it, Jesus had his own shadow mission. But for Jesus, the issue wasn't simply keeping his mouth shut and not rocking the boat. For Jesus, Jesus' shadow mission was the ever-present temptation to take a shortcut around his father's plan, to reach for the crown without having to embrace the cross. So Jesus' decision is very similar to Esther's to, to, to back away or to step forward and allow himself to be swept up in his father's greater purposes. But there is one important difference. Unlike Esther, nobody had to push Jesus Nobody had to convince and conjole him that this was the right thing to do. Fact is, Jesus Christ came for this very purpose. He came not at the risk of his own life, but at the cost of his life. Knowing that nothing less than the giving of his whole self would save us from our sins and save us from everything that threatens to annihilate us. Friends, let me tell you, it's true that great moments are born out of great opportunities. And with the craziness in the world around us today, the opportunities to clearly delineate the gospel stand before us like never before. But the opportunity only exists because Jesus went before us and did for us what we can never do for ourselves by dying on the cross and rising from the dead and calling us now to join him in his great redemptive plan for the world. As Ortberg says, we cannot live without purpose. But we never realize that purpose if we miss out on God's call for our lives. 
using all the gifts and the talents and the abilities and the resources he's given us to stand in the gap right where we are and to proclaim the truth for such a time as this. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for Jesus Christ, your Son. Lord, the one who came for us, the one who took up our sins on the cross, the one who died for us, the one who was tempted by the mission to reach for the crown without having to embrace that cross, Lord, the one who now calls us to follow where he leads. Father God, it is amazing to think that of all the billions of people who've ever lived, that you have put each one of us right here now for such a time as this. That our births, our lives, our talents, our gifts, our abilities, they're not accidents, Lord, but they're from your hand. And Lord, as you called Esther to step up, to step out, to speak the truth to power, Lord, that you call your people, Lord, to also be shining witnesses. Lord, help us to discover that mission and what it means in each of our individual lives. Lord, you've called some of us inside the church. You've called most of us outside the church. You've put your people, Lord, throughout the world. Give us a vision of the mission to which you've called us. And Father God, we ask that in Jesus' name you would bless this church, that we may be faithful to that mission always. Always speaking the truth in love holding out the hope of forgiveness and grace in Jesus Christ. Father God, bless this church, Lord, the people in it, those who are struggling right now, Lord, with illness, those who at this very moment are, Lord, transitioning from this life to the next one. Comfort them and their families, Lord, be with them. Be with us, Lord, for this celebration of EBS we begin tonight, Lord, that you would bless the children, Lord, their hearts may be open to you. Bless our leadership, Lord. Thank you, Lord for everyone who put in so many hours even to get us to this point to make it possible. Thank you, Lord, for them embracing their mission. And Lord, fill us with your spirit that wherever you call us, Lord, that we may do you honor and honor the name of Christ. And it's in his name that we pray now together as one church body. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, I'd like to invite you to stand for our second hymn of the morning, Shout to the North.